Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Frontiers of World Closure event and Faith Spacey Time. Marco, you want to carry on? All right, so in these first minutes, we will wait uh, for more people to arrive in case there might be some people yet uh, doing that and I mean, late, but you know, we have to wait for those people, they are also people. <laughs> Uh, but after that, uh, we will interview a very, very, very special person today. Um, he is the senior astronomer and director uh, from SETI, from the SETI Institute. And, well, you may ask, what is SETI? Uh, we are going to talk about that, so that is why you don't have to leave. But it is basically the uh, Search for Extraterrestrial, Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute. Um, as I said, more information uh, in the coming minutes. Then, um, so, uh, I don't know, uh, Seth, is there anything that I didn't say from you? Anything you want to add? Oh, no, I, no. I wouldn't talk to <laughs> them about me. That's boring. It's even more boring than <laughs> what I might say now, so. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, if you want to see more stuff from him, uh, the content that he does, he, he has a lot of, uh, I don't know, a lot, he has at least a couple of TED Talks, I would say. Uh, then there is the SETI YouTube channel, he has some interviews there, very interesting. Well, he is the one doing the interview there, and he is a very good interviewer, I have to say that. And then he has a podcast, he does every week, so, you know, a lot of content from him. Uh, so, how is this going to work? Uh, first of all, uh, my friend Joaquin here is going to ask some stuff uh, about his career and and his uh, progression in general uh, through time. Uh, then uh, Luke is going to ask more about SETI and its functioning, uh, what does it do, and a lot of interesting stuff related to it. Uh, then Sylvia uh, is going to ask more questions uh, related to you know, the importance that uh, SETI might have, uh, not only SETI, but space exploration and, uh, you know, uh, search for life in other places apart from there. And then we will end with uh, questions from you guys. So if you have any question, I will be checking the chat uh, frequently. So yes, uh, put them there and we will ask them once we end. So I think I'm gonna start. Um, so the one thing, Marco, um, we will be recording the event. So um, it, and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel over the week. So next week. So you will be able to watch it again and share it with anyone. And yeah, you can go on. Yeah, so I wanted to start first. I, I think that I didn't tell you before when we were meeting without anyone else here, but um, I thought about making this kind of uh, game or something like that, I will tell you now. So I will, I am going to say one word and you will have to tell me another word that comes to your mind when I say my word. Is that clear? I explained it a bit weirdly, but did you, did you get it? Is, it, is this a psychological test? <laughs> it might be, it might be, uh, it might be, but it is just, you know, to know uh, for, for our guests to know you better in case they haven't seen many stuff like you. So, uh, you have to answer as fast as possible. That is important. So, shall we start with that? Yeah. Um, okay, first word. Steady. Are you asking me or are you asking the audience? No, I'm asking you. I'm asking you. Oh. You, have to, you have to answer me with one word that is, you know, the first word that comes to your mind. Employer. Alien. Uh, neighbor. Oh, one more. Say it again. Oh, more, more. I don't know if I'm oh, pronouncing oh, it properly. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. More, more. Lobe. Astrobiology. Uh, Mars. Seth Stostak. <laughs> uh, taxes. Intelligence. Uh, Washington. Exoplanets. Home. Life. 
Death. Life, and you cannot repeat. Oh, uh, metabolism. Life, and you cannot repeat again. <laughs> oh, um, Darwin. All right. Thank you for that. Okay, so I think now, more or less, uh, people who are here know what you know what uh, life they can expect from this. And I think that Joaquin, okay, it's your turn for uh, to start with your questions. Yeah, sure. So this has been quite interesting, actually. Uh, we we usually do this exercise of um, asking to our speakers what's life in two words. But this time has been in a more fancy way. But it's been interesting answers. Actually, and um, so, well, yeah, I'm, well, for everyone, I'm Joaquin, and I'm a uh, president of the society, well, Marco was not finance director, and then Luke and Silvia, you can also introduce yourselves. And um, so my first question was actually, it's uh, also a personal one. So um, I saw that you were first interested in space. I don't know if these are the kind of things that you just say on in an interview or that maybe just appear in the newspapers, but I, I, I saw somewhere that you were, you were, you became first interested in space when you were reading a book about the solar system at the age of 10 or something like that. So which book was it? Yeah, uh, well, that is true. My interest mm -hmm. in astronomy uh, goes back to when I was eight, actually 10, and by 10, I'd already lost the interest, but it was when I was eight years old and I was very interested in maps at that age. And I was looking through an atlas that my parents had in the house. And at the back of the atlas was this diagram with a bunch of circles around it. And I asked my mother what those, those circles represented. And she said, well, those are the orbits of planets, a word that I hadn't heard. And uh, I think that's when I started to get interested. But I think if, if I could say so, I think everybody gets interested in something between the ages of eight and 11. I think that that's the way we're wired. And uh, usually those are the interests that we keep for our entire lives. Okay, yeah, so that's, that's interesting. I thought, uh, yeah, that, that might make sense, isn't it? Uh, isn't it? Because it's true that, I mean, in those stages, uh, yeah, becoming interested in stuff, definitely is one of the main things. So in terms of, books and just following on that one do you have any book that you that you would recommend um us or anyone starting on this or any um bible for astrobiologists or anyone into city well there's a tendency for me to want to say you know to name some books that i'm involved with but only because i know them better <laughs> i i am a co-author on a textbook about astrobiology and i think it's called life in the universe but textbooks are very expensive these days. You know, I, I think the best thing to do is to do what anybody else would do. If you're interested, have the slightest interest in this material, go to the library. You'll find lots of books there at all levels and, and just read a little bit. And after that, you can find just tons of material on the web, of course. Uh, but also, you know, you can, you can find books at any level. So it's, there's nothing magic about how you might pursue an interest. Makes sense. So, well, just for people to know, uh, and correct me if I say something wrong. So you got your degree in physics from Princeton. Yes. And then, and then you went on to a PhD in astrobiology from the California Institute of, but sorry, in astrobiology and astronomy from the California Institute of Technology. So I guess that at some point during this year, during those years that you were uh, starting your career on this, um, you might have received some kind of advice or you talk to your lecturers if you were interested in the thing. So is there any single piece of advice or something like that that you remember as a key thing in defining where you were heading to or something like yeah, that? Yeah, well, Joaquin, you're right. I, I was an undergraduate uh, studying physics. That was my degree. And I applied to graduate school also in physics. So I was admitted to Caltech in the physics department, but my first week or two on campus, I was walking around the astronomy department because I, I had always, you know, since the age of eight, been interested in astronomy. And they had all these big pictures on the walls of nebulae, but also lots of pictures, excellent pictures, drawings 
of the 200 inch, which is about five meters, the 200 inch telescope that Caltech had, the, the Palomar telescope, which at the time was the biggest telescope in the world, optical telescope. And those look so interesting. I thought, you know, astronomy is much more interesting than physics. You know, and I just asked if I could change departments, and they said, "Okay." So that was it. I mean, it, it, it wasn't I, I, that somebody gave that. me any advice or that I went to Delphi and talked to an oracle or anything like that. And I just walked around the physics or the astronomy department, and it looked like it was more fun. I'm not sure it was, but I I felt that it might be. That's fun. I mean, well, I guess that that happens to lots of people nowadays, and it's true that I mean. Especially into this science, well, it happens to myself actually. I, I mean, when you're into these things that are very interdisciplinary, or that you, I mean, I guess that if you're interested in the search for life in the universe, you have to be interested in lots of things. So maybe sometimes it's hard to define or to choose on just one path or to narrow it down to just one field. So, well, but keep in mind that this wasn't an interest in life in the universe, right? Uh, that wasn't being done at that time, right? This was before the, uh, True. just before the Spanish-American War, actually. So this was a long time ago, and uh, you know, astrobiology or SETI. Uh, they didn't exist at the time. They, well, they really didn't. I mean, there were there had been some SETI experiments, but they didn't exist. It was just astronomy. And in fact, for most of my career in astronomy, I wasn't doing SETI. I was uh, studying galaxies. So. Yeah, I get that. Which makes sense, obviously, because obviously it was. I mean, lots of things have changed. In, in, these are pretty new field, not new, but true really that we have defined them, defined them recently. So, so in that case, um, is there any advice that you would have liked to receive when you were starting on this, but that you haven't, and that you would like to give to people now? On well, I mean, look, I I know that as young students. You're not interested in what some old guy tells you uh, and says, here's some advice. I certainly wouldn't have listened to him. Uh, so you're probably not going to listen to me. But the one thing I would say uh, is that, and this is, this is kind of trite, actually, but is that follow your interests. Study things that you're interested in as opposed to studying something that somebody else thinks you ought to study, like your parents or an advisor or stuff like that. Just ask yourself, what do I want to read on the weekends when I don't have to study for school, right? What, what are my real interests? And, and, and study those, because you'll, in the end, be much better at it. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, you, that's, if you are interested in that, if you keep, if you spend your free time reading those things, that means that you are definitely interested in those things. Yes. Yeah, I mean, makes sense. So this, well, this wasn't prepared, but so I'm, um, I guess that obviously at the time there weren't that much uh, people to follow or something like that uh, in terms of, in, well, within us, well, there were pretty great astronomers at the time, but that's pretty obvious, but is there or was there anyone that inspired you at the time or maybe even now? I mean, do you have any, when I when I say who inspires you, does um, anyone come to, your mind, come to your mind? Yeah, well, people, I, I do get asked that, you know, who are your heroes? Right, you're curious. Is it, yeah. you know, Iron Man. Fancy, but that's the question in the end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Superman. I always like Superman. Uh, but I, I think that my, if I have to name a person, I mean, my heroes were people from the 19th century, uh, like Edison, right, and and Carnegie and Tesla and all these guys. I was very interested in electronics uh, for a long time, and uh, so these guys who did that, and I had an interest in the railroads. So people who built the railroads in this country were great interest to me. Uh, so there there were all those, but those were historical people. And in terms of people that were alive when I was a student and are still alive today, I think I always named Frank Drake, who was the guy who started the whole field of SETI. Frank Drake is still around. And, uh, you know, I, I just found him inspirational, not so much for the work. It was his attitude towards his work that inspired me. He was very low key. He was never critical of other people. Well, never really critical of other people. He was the last gentleman on earth, as far as I could tell. So I thought that, you know, that was kind of inspirational. I, I wanted to be like him, but unfortunately, it didn't happen. 
That's nice. We actually we 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 actually talked about a bit about him last week, and our and our we have this kind of um scientific post as well our astrobiology related uh, stuff, and we actually talk about it. So I, I'm I'm pretty sure that our followers will be aware of it. So um carry on this I guess this of not being as great as him, but it's um uh, certainly true that you have lots ton of things you have done lots of things. So is there like um have you ever feel or well even but um when was if you have ever feel like um you were contributing towards some something bigger than us or have you ever feeling that way like you were working towards um yeah another I mean not doing like uh terrestrial stuff let's say in that way have you ever how have you ever felt in that way? Well, I, I, I'm not sure I understand the question, Joaquin, but I guess what you're asking is, is there anything that I've done that I thought was, you know, going to still be interesting 200 years from now? And uh, That's another way of putting it. Yeah, <laughs> well, maybe the answer is nothing. But uh, in terms of research, I mean, SETI has not found anything, not yet. Okay, So you could say, well, what can you point to? Are you, are you any closer to finding the aliens than you were 10 years ago? Anything like that. We can talk about all that, but probably the one thing that I did that um, did have some consequence was when I was studying galaxies as a student, actually, and I found that they rotated too quickly in the outer regions. This was due to what's called dark matter, but that was kind of one of the first indicators of that. It's, it's not so well known. Uh, people know about the work of Vera Rubin, but Vera Rubin uh, had a daughter who was my student, and I had her working on these rotation curves, and then Vera okay. started working on it. So it's, it's, it's kind of a hidden story, but uh, that early work with the galaxies might be the most important thing in terms of my scientific career. That's nice. I didn't, I didn't know that. It sounds scared. totally boring. That's why nobody wants to turn on their cameras, because they're all asleep. <laughs> are you? Well, hopefully, hopefully they are, and I, I'm seeing some faces, even though I have you been because of this thing. For no, those people. those are animated, I think. <laughs> so um, I guess I'll carry on to the. So it's true that obviously, well, SETI hasn't haven't um, hasn't found anything yet. Oh, well, I, I won't get into that case. I think that Luke has lots of things to say um, about that in the following minutes. But um, I guess that somehow, if we ever find life elsewhere in the universe you would be one of the very first persons to know about it um if the government if the u.s government allows you so um well have you i guess you have realized that at some point so how do you feel about that well i mean it sounds like a good thing right i think it would be <laughs> i mean job job security right i mean <laughs> if you actually found the aliens but i can tell you that we have had uh, occasions when we thought we had found the aliens, right? Mm -hmm. Where we picked up a signal, we thought, this is it, right? This is it. And so that is a good, it turns out it wasn't the aliens, but which was sort of disappointing, but uh, it does sort of give you a, it's like a crystal ball. It shows you the future because it demonstrated what would really happen if we were to find a signal. And I can tell you that it's very uncomfortable, at least it was for me, because I was, was thinking it? of all, yeah, I was thinking of all the things that I would have to change in my life. If we found the aliens, you know, suddenly that lunch I was going to have with a potential donor next week, is we got to blow that off. And all those meetings and the 427 Zoom meetings that I'm going to have this afternoon, all of that would have to be changed, right? And so uh, it was actually very uncomfortable. Surprising. I'm sure it would have, you know, changed if... It really was ET. I mean, I'm sure within a week things would change. But I can tell you what happens is the phone starts ringing right away because the newspapers, and radio, and TV stations are calling up right away. They they all that's, know about it. That's true. I mean, and even now in our uh, fully fully communicated world, I guess that it would be even worse. I mean, someone would leak a tweet and suddenly everyone exactly. would know about it. So that would yep. have been even worse. Yep. So that's right. Yeah, I mean, I guess that that's definitely not a great thing about your job. Um, but what's the best part of it? Or, I mean, if you think of a 
yeah, just one thing, or well, I mean, a couple of them, which are the, what's the best thing of um, what you do? Well, I think probably the fact that, to begin with, there aren't many people doing this, right? The total number of people in the world uh, that are doing SETI is more or less the number of people that are, you know, logged into Zoom here. That's a total number in the world, <laughs> right? It's very small. So that means you know all the other people. And in general, people are the things that you get most uh, excited about. Those are, you know, interactions with people. And then those are also the things you get most annoyed about. But people, people are kind of it. But in terms of the subject matter, I think working in SETI, because I've worked in many jobs, actually. But working in SETI is at least addressing a big question, right? I mean, you know, I could have taken a job repairing automobiles or something or bicycles or something, I'd probably be better at bicycles, but, you know, and, and that might be okay. It might pay for the mortgage, it might pay the rent, whatever. Yeah. But it isn't answering any big questions. Whereas SETI, which, you know, of course hasn't succeeded so far, but SETI actually would answer very big questions. So in a sense that gives it a certain edge that makes it, uh, makes it very interesting, despite the fact that, you know, no ET so far. I mean, you have said it so far, and I guess that at least, even though, I mean, it's just working towards it, because obviously in the end, I mean... Yeah, well, we'll take well, some we, time. I, I think it'll um, take time, but not very much time, actually. I think that if SETI is going to succeed, if this whole idea that you can find the aliens by pointing big antennas at the sky and trying to find a signal, if, if that's a useful idea, then, you know, just looking at the numbers, then SETI should succeed uh, before any of you people are uh, middle-aged, right? So it'll uh, it'll happen either it'll happen quickly or there's just it's just the wrong experiment, which is possible. I, I guess that that will be disappointing to some of the people here today because I'm pretty sure that they are as eager as I am to contribute to that search uh, to be the first ones or um, at least I mean to be in that right. group you of. <laughs> you, you get a trip to Sweden and collect a prize. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that would be it, isn't it? Um, so before I get on to look, um, I guess that uh, just wrap up this. So in terms of this, and um, yeah, I mean, it's somehow related, but so where do you see this whole thing going? But basically in terms of what you do, so I mean, in a short, long term, so I mean, as long as you can contribute to it, so I mean, yeah, what else do you think you can give to this? Um, well, to this look, the, yeah, the experiment is pretty much run by others now, and uh, it's all automated. You know, if you go to the movies and they have a SETI scene, many of them do actually, you know, you see somebody with earphones on, right? And they're listening for ET. Well, obviously, that's not the way it works. Uh, uh -huh. It's all automated. It's all done by computers. So it's in a sense, you know, you're sleeping, but the observatory is looking for the aliens, right? So that, that's a great deal. You know, people worry about computers taking over their job. Well, in this case, it's a good thing because it's... I mean, be otherwise, very, you'd be very it would be the, one, the ones coming to it, so... Yeah, yeah, and, you would, and you would need a lot of earphones because, you know, the, the experiments now, uh, we monitor like 100 million channels, right? So that would be 50 million pairs of earphones. You know, who's going to volunteer to wear earphones? So it, it's somewhat automated. But in the meantime, you can think of new ways to do it, right? So th that's unlimited. I mean, you're trying to second guess what the aliens are doing. So that's kind of fun. And the other thing that I do a lot of actually is uh, what, what's called outreach, right? So uh, trying to get people interested in science and also to some extent to correct a lot of the misinformation that people have, particularly in this country, the United States, there's a lot of, uh, the science literacy is pretty low. And people don't understand science. And, you know, they, they say they want to and so forth and so on, but most of them don't. And you know, there, there are lots of reasons for that, but to the extent that you can get people interested in something that is very interesting, which is to say science, you know, it's a, it's exploration. Um, yeah. That might make a difference 200 years from now. 
Who knows? I mean, I'm pretty sure it, it will. Uh, obviously, I mean, I, I, as far as we know, I think you're doing a pretty good job at it. And def- I mean, that's why being with us here today. Uh, so, <laughs> so I mean, all I can but, say is- But these is people that- are already interested in science. They, they should well, go out their front door and grab somebody else who's not. That's what they ought to do. So you have you all have homework for the next time you have to bring someone in. Yeah. <laughs> if, so uh, I think, Luke, your turn to carry, to carry on. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, whenever you want. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm just going to ask a couple of questions about like SETI itself and what that means and things like that. So I guess to get started, just could you describe a bit what SETI is, what it does, how it works, that sort of thing? Sure. Well, SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, which I notice is almost my name, right? It's one letter off. That's but quite convenient, really, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's convenient. Yes. Although it makes my email address confusing. Anyhow, SETI is just started as an attempt to find the aliens by picking up a signal of some sort. And it's mostly been radio, but not exclusively listening for radio signals. But there are also experiments where you look for flashing lasers, right? I mean, that would be a way to communicate too. Uh, It's just that radio is an older technology than lasers by about 50 years. And as a consequence, you know, SETI began with radio. But when I joined the SETI Institute, right, as I said, that was, I think, the Mexican-American War, not sure. Uh, might, might have been the Spanish Armada uh, meeting the British. I'm not quite sure, but whenever, when I joined the Institute, it was only SETI. That was the only experiment. And it was a NASA program. But, uh, you know, the politicians in the United States, none of whom are scientists, by the way, uh, killed the NASA program a, about two years after I joined. That was a very dramatic thing to suddenly see no more money. So since then, SETI has been run on the basis of private donations. And so that, that, that's a real problem for the organization, but in any case. But it was just SETI. The SETI Institute did SETI. We're listening for the aliens. And that was true up until in the late 1990s, say 2000, when we took on another project where people were studying Mars. Today, that, that has continued. Today, uh, there are like 100 PhD scientists at the SETI Institute, and all but maybe one or two of them is doing what's called astrobiology. So they're interested in life in space, but it's not the kind of life that you could uh, invite to talk to the group here. I mean, you could, but they wouldn't say much because they are microscopic, right? So if you're talking about life on Mars, there may be life on Mars, but you'll, you'll need a microscope to see it, right? So that's what they're doing. And the reason that that's what the SETI Institute is doing mostly is because of money. And of course, most of the people on this call are are too young to be worried about money. That comes later in life. But, you know, money, in fact, if there's no money, it's very hard to do the research. That's the bottom line. So SETI is always crippled by the lack of money. But astrobiology, as it's called, is not. So today, the SETI Institute is mostly astrobiologists. Anybody still awake? Well, you're definitely talking to the right people then, aren't you? <laughs> I guess. I, I never know if I'm talking to the right people. You know, I can tell when I'm talking to the wrong people because they just, you know, disappear. Yeah. <laughs> um, you probably get this question a lot, but um, why do you think SETI is actually important? Like, so many people would argue that what's the point, you think? Well, yeah, many people would and do. I can remember many times when I've been talking to a crowd and the first question is something like, well, look, why are you spending tax dollars to send these, you know, motorized skateboards to Mars? <laughs> to wander around Mars, to dig up some dirt, maybe find some dead microbes. Why are you doing that when we have all these problems right here on Earth, right? And there are plenty of problems on Earth. And so you, you have to explain to them why it is important. And from my point of view, it's very, I mean, even aside from SETI, SETI is exploration, right? And exploration is something that some societies do and others do not. The British were very big on exploration, right? And it has a lot of survival value. And it isn't just a matter of, you know, extending the British empire and so forth. I mean, 
may be of why the, the, the Navy was interested in the Admiralty, but exploration is something that is important to a society. If there's something going on that's beyond the worries of your next meal, right? Or, you know, your job or things like that. And so some societies do it and others don't. And I think it's, it's like, you could say it's, it's, it's just to know whether there's somebody out there. It's important uh, in the same sense that, uh, you know, knowing that our ancestors were living in the trees and had a lot more hair. I mean, you know, you could say, well, what's the practical benefit of that? And the answer is it's a psychological benefit, but I think it's essential. Curiosity is not a luxury, in other mm -hmm. words. Yeah, I really like that answer, actually. <laughs> Um, what do you think is the outlook that we'll actually find something or that you at SETI will find something within our lifetimes? I think you did touch on it a little bit earlier. Yes. So, yeah. Well, I think it's very high, actually. Um, and, and maybe that's wishful thinking. It could be that it's just, oh, well, Seth, you know, of course, he doesn't want to think that this whole career was for nothing and they're going the wrong direction. That could be, actually. But fortunately, I've had lots of jobs, so I don't worry about any one of them in particular. <laughs> But I was asked this question when I was giving a talk in in Germany, actually, Bremen, not, not Berlin, in Bremen a uh, number of years ago. And they asked exactly that question, Luke, when are we going to find E.T.? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, if we don't find E.T. within two dozen years, I'll buy you all a cup of Starbucks. I'll buy you all a flat white. I'll buy you mm -hmm. all some coffee. And almost anybody who interviews me from a newspaper brings that up and they say, are you, are you prepared now to buy a lot of coffee? But, but it hasn't been two dozen years yet. So I don't owe anybody coffee yet. Just yet. <laughs> but, but the reason I said that was not just to amuse them or entertain them or uh, offend them or whatever it did. It's just that the, uh, the experiments that SETI's doing are getting faster all the time. That's because of computers mostly. You know, where I'm speaking from, this is the Silicon Valley around me here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're, they're making faster and faster computers all the time because they don't want you to be too happy with the computer you bought, right? They want you to trade it in after three years. It's just like the automobile business. But, you know, computers don't get ruined by salt on the roads or they don't, don't get hit by other computers or anything like that. So they, they have to do something to make you want to buy a new computer. And what they do is they make them faster. And that applies to SETI too. And that's why I said within two dozen years, because we will have looked at a few million star mm -hmm. systems within two dozen years. Sorry for the long answer. But... That was a good answer. So is that, that's touching on like Moore's law and stuff, isn't it? Where the, is it the speed of computers doubles and or the power doubles every so many years or something like that? Yes, it's every 18 months. It's every two years, essentially. Right, okay. That, that's Moore's law. Yeah, Moore is here in the Valley somewhere. Oh, wow. <laughs> Um, so actually, if we did make contact then, what do you think the most likely contact would be? I guess it's but, not going to be aliens coming to visit us, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, that would be really interesting uh, in the same ways that it was interesting in the 1500s when uh, <laughs> aliens came to visit the Americas. You know, if you, you know, these Spanish land on your uh, island and you've never seen any Europeans, it's probably an interesting day for you. But... Uh, I don't think the aliens are going to land. I mean, that's what Hollywood does because it's a more interesting story if they land and, you know, start to destroy Los Angeles. Now, mind you, I, do, I, I, I want to make this clear. If the aliens want to destroy Los Angeles, I'm, I'm willing to let it go. I mean, I, it's okay by me. But that's not likely what's going to happen because they don't know we're here, right? In order for them to know we're here, they have to be pretty close because we haven't been broadcasting very long. Any, any of these clues that Homo sapiens is here. So I don't expect they're gonna come here. It's also very difficult to come here. But so the, the contact is more likely you pick up a signal that probably wasn't meant for you because they don't know we're here. Uh, you know, so why would they send a signal this way? It's probably an accident that you pick up a signal that wasn't intended for you. In the same way that you could go down to the beach. I know there are no beaches in Manchester, but there are beaches within a couple of hours or something. So you go down to the beach and you you go, you know, and you find this bottle. And it's got a message in it. It probably wasn't directed to, to you, but it was just sort of a broadcast message. So I think that that's what it'll be. It'll be a, a, some sort of signal. I doubt that we ever can figure out what it means, if it means anything, it probably means something. 
but it may have been sent hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago. So you, you can't, you're not in a conversation. It's like getting a text, but you can't text anything back. But in this case, it would be pretty interesting to get a text. It's the right sort of text, huh? Well, I don't, I don't know the right ones from the wrong ones. Any text. Uh, next one, we've actually, this is from one of the people in the comments, but um, are there any plans for SETI, like for the first time that we detect a signal like this? There are, uh, in fact, there's, there's what called a protocol, right? This was the idea of uh, somebody who worked for the Institute back in the days when it was a NASA uh, project. It was in fact, the idea of a British uh, physician who said, we have to have a protocol. And, you know, I've been involved with the reworking of the protocol. In fact, we did a lot of that back to, during a meeting in Valencia, uh, Spain, years and years ago. And it's, but the protocol isn't very interesting. People think, oh, protocol, huh? Must be top secret. It's not top secret, it's on the web. You, know, you can find it, but it's not so interesting. It just says, if you pick up a signal, the first thing you do is you check it to make sure you really have an extra terrestrial signal. Well, of course you do that. That's just science, right? The second thing you do is you tell everybody. Yeah, well, of course you do that because everybody already knows there's no secrecy. And the third thing, and this is the only interesting part of this protocol, is that you shouldn't broadcast anything back without international consultation. But, you know, the protocol doesn't say what that means. It could just mean that international consultation, you get the Madrid soccer team to agree that we could send this message back. I mean, that's international consultation, but it doesn't really mean too much. Anyhow, this protocol is there, but I, I can tell you that nobody thinks of it when you pick up a signal that looks like it might be ET. Your first concern is only let's verify this signal. And the media already know about it, so they're already calling you up. It's not interesting. <laughs> okay, going a little bit more out there then. If aliens visited us here, what do you think would happen? Well, if they visited us here, I mean, if the aliens came here, obviously they're technically very, very advanced. It's not yeah. easy to go to another star system. I don't know how many people here have tried it, but it's, it's just not easy, right? <laughs> you, you know, the, the rockets we have take almost 100,000 years to go even to the nearest other star. And that's a long trip when the food isn't good on the on the spacecraft. So uh, if they can come here, they're very much more advanced. And that means that whatever they want to do, they can do it, All right? It, it's it's like, you know, it's, it's like the, uh, I don't know, the British army visiting some Neanderthals in the forest. Whatever they want to do, they can do. And the yeah. Neanderthals just have to take it. Now, I, I don't think the aliens would come here just to kill us all. I mean, what's the point? It just, it just costs them money and there's no benefit. So I, I don't, they might come here out of curiosity. There have been panels held, actually, in which we discuss why would anybody come here? You know, why do we, what do we have that we can offer them? I mean, you know, aside from, I don't know, baked goods or something. I mean, what, what is it that we have that would appeal to the aliens? And it turns out there's nothing that we have that they don't have, except maybe the culture, right? That they, they, they might come to, to, to look at the art or, you know, oh, you guys have something you call DNA. That's interesting. Not like us, we've got something better. Well, whatever, right? So curiosity might be it. Or the only other thing to think of is uh, they come as missionaries, right? They, they, they're here to convert us to some other religion or something like that. But beyond that, there's no reason to come to earth, really. So it's basically space tourism or space religion. Yeah, it's space tourism, space religion, or you might have some scientists who have a grant to go collect biology around okay. the, the galaxy. Yeah. Uh, that's that's great. Thank you. Um, I'll probably hand over to Sylvia now, who's got some questions, um, just more about your thoughts on different things like that. Okay. On extraterrestrial life. Thank I, you. I don't I don't envy envy Sylvia. <laughs> Hi. Uh, most of my questions have been answered already, so I will try to make them more interesting this time. <laughs> um, 
Well, as you have already answered, why should we should care about uh, finding extraterrestrial life? What is your answer to those people that might be afraid of, of the unknown? Um, so these people um, might say, okay, we are assuming a risk, sending uh, signals or, or whatever to the space. So what is the point of, of that? Yeah. I, I, well, I, I, are you asking what's the point of picking up the signal, or why are people afraid? Which yeah, no, no. I'm. I know why people are afraid. What's the point in trying to to find extraterrestrial life if there's a risk there of of them to uh, to destroy us? Oh, okay. I, I, yeah. I know. Yeah. No, th that that's true. There, there have been some experiments where we weren't just listening. Remember, SETI is totally passive, right? We point antennas at this guy and we have these fancy radio receivers and we try and find a signal. But there's no danger in that, of course. It's like you turning in, you're getting in your car and you tune in the BBC, right? But the, the person down at, you know, Bush House in London, where the BBC is headquartered, they don't know that you've tuned them in. They're not gonna destroy you. <laughs> they don't even know you did it, right? So there's no danger in, in just listening, of course. But some people have suggested, and some people do, say, well, why don't we broadcast too, not just listen. We'll broadcast some message, hello, ET, we're the Earthlings, and we'd love to hear from you, or whatever. And, you know, a little of that has been done, but very little. And But other people would say, well, you shouldn't do that, because, you know, you're just telling the aliens we're here, and if they're nasty aliens, because some of them will be, presumably, you know, they'll just come here and once again, you know, take out important American cities. They usually leave Europe alone. Well, okay. Even Stephen Hawking said you shouldn't do it, that it might be dangerous. But you have to keep in mind that if Stephen Hawking had said something publicly about his favorite sandwich restaurant, you know, people would have taken that very seriously because it's Stephen Hawking. But it doesn't mean that it really is the best sandwich restaurant. So I, I think that uh, there's no danger here that you should worry about because we are broadcasting all the time, not to the aliens, but our radars and also television, by the way. But the radars are very powerful. And, you know, you have a radar at the, in the local airport, which is very useful when the weather is bad. It's good to have it. But you're not going to turn it off because it might also tell ED. Wow, they've got airports. Let's go destroy them all. Uh, so I, you know, I, I, I don't worry about broadcasting, but there's almost none of it is being done. Okay, thank you for your answer. This makes a lot of sense. Um, I have another question related to well, maybe you don't know much about it, but um, to the extent that you know, how do you think there? intelligence is going to be similar to, to ours and what about science is science aliens science going to be similar to the one we are doing here at there yeah uh, well i think you can say it, it depends this is almost philosophical depends on your view of science is science that just something that we invented or does science have an existence outside of human brains if you will that question is often asked about mathematics. Did we invent mathematics or was mathematics just out there and we found it the way you would find shells on the shores of the beach as Isaac Newton used to talk about. And, and I don't know how you all feel about it, but I think that science is something that does exist, uh, it, it, you know, outside of humans, because if you look at stars or galaxies that are very far away, you know, they're obeying the same laws of physics that the ones that are right next to us do. So that suggests that science is something that's everywhere. And, you know, so if you asked, will the aliens have the same science? I think they will, in the sense that they've got to come up with all the same uh, discoveries that we have. It's, it's, uh, it's possible that they just express it in different ways. I mean, in the 1600s, for example, the Japanese had mathematicians, but they had not invented calculus, which of course was done in Europe by Newton and Leibniz. These guys invented calculus. 
So they, they solved a very general class of mathematical problems. The Japanese were able to solve specific pro, uh, problems by very complicated means. And if they had only seen what Newton was doing, they would have saved themselves a lot of trouble. Well, eventually they did within a hundred years, you know, that, that uh, knowledge went from Europe to Japan, but they had mathematics. It just didn't look like our mathematics, but it was the same stuff. So I think that that's the way you have to look at the alien science. It's the same science. It's just that they formulate it in whatever way is appropriate to their own culture. Is that suitably nebulous? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, uh, well, you talked before about, um, yeah, the kind of, of well, that we are not sending any, any signal broadcasting, but if it was up to you, once maybe we have uh, contact, contacted someone uh, somewhere, uh, what song or film and painting and object could you um, send them to, to show them just like a picture of what we are doing here on Earth? Well, <laughs> I mean, people have tried to answer that question because there were these plaques that went on the Pioneer spacecraft and also this, these records on the Voyager spacecraft. And people were trying to decide, okay, we can say something to the aliens in case they ever pick up this stuff. Now, what is it going to be? And in the first case, in the case of the plaque, it was about the information that you would get on a birthday card, right? There's a picture and there's a little bit of text. And so what they had was they had a nude man and a woman and some diagrams and stuff like that. Well, that caused a, a bit of a problem in the United States because, you know, this is the United States, but, you know, they said, we're sending, our tax dollars are being used to send pornography to the aliens. <laughs> and so that's the way they looked at it. Um, that says something about the American public. But, so the, the, the Voyager records, they were very careful, only to use silhouettes, right? No pornography. Uh, so they've already, you know, considered, well, what do we tell them? You tell them something about what we look like and the animals and DNA and the solar system. You tell them, you know, this basic stuff, sort of third grade science, right? Uh, maybe that's in interesting. But I honestly think that if you really were communicating with the aliens, I mean, if you were broadcasting to them, you all that stuff, why send them a greeting card? If you're going to talk to them, send them something useful. And uh, actually, it turns out that you could easily, over the course of a couple of days, you could send uh, the entire World Wide Web. You could send the Internet. And I think that that would be much more interesting to them and also much easier for them to figure out because it's all this material. It's like decoding the hieroglyphics, right? If you have a lot of material, you can figure it out. So I would just send them the Internet and, you know, the Americans would say, yeah, but there's pornography on the Internet. Well, it doesn't bother me particularly. I mean, I, I noticed the birds outside my window here. None of them is wearing clothes, but it doesn't offend me. <laughs> okay. Um, if, if you were now an alien and you came to Earth, uh, what famous figure would you like to, to meet first? Like an ambassador or, or something? Well, I wouldn't know, of course. I mean, my questions for the aliens are always, do you have religion or do you have music? Those are the two questions I usually ask because, uh, you know, I, I assume they have science because otherwise we probably didn't meet. But, you know, uh, something like music, is, is that something that other intelligent creatures would have or not? Maybe that's just something that humans have. You know, it's not clear it has a lot of survival value. I mean, unless you're Mozart, then it has survival value for him. But you know what I mean? Those, I've forgotten the question, but I, I think those are the things I would I would be most interested in talking to them about. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I, I don't know about meeting somebody important, you know, take me okay. to Donald Trump or something like that. I, I, I mean, that, that's like, the, you know, the Spaniards land in the new world and they don't say to whomever they meet on the beach, hey, take us to your leader. <laughs> I don't think they need that. Okay. Fair enough. So I think that now we can start with the uh, questions, Marco. Yeah, actually, we have 
a lot of questions from from the uh, the people here in the Zoom call. So uh, and some of them are very related to what we have been talking. Uh, so uh, Drew Mystery, I think I I'm not pronouncing that properly, but I'm sorry about that. Uh, asked before, how many telescopes and telescope time is dedicated to SETI projects, and is it enough? Yeah, well, uh, it's traditionally not been very much. For about four or five years, we were using the big radio telescope down in Puerto Rico, the Arecibo. Unfortunately, that's collapsed now, so you know we're not using it anymore. But we would get the equivalent of a few weeks of observing time per year. It's not much, right? Telescope time is a valuable resource. But the SETI Institute has its own set of telescopes, uh, the Allen Telescope Array, which is about 500 kilometers north of San Francisco in the mountains. So we, we can use that all the time. And also, we're going to be doing an experiment using the Very Large Array, which is a, a big telescope in New Mexico, but you know, in a, what's called a parasitic mode. In other words, we are doing SETI while somebody else is doing conventional astronomy. Actually, I think that it, there can be a further question in this question, uh, which is, I mean, what would you think uh, that enough is? What would be enough for you? <laughs> well, I, I mean, the you know, the, it's like asking, uh, you know, what would be enough ice cream for you? Yeah, I don't know, <laughs> I mean, maybe semi-infinite, but you know, Obviously, the more telescopes you have looking at the sky, then maybe the faster you'll find something. The best experiment would be to big, build really big arrays of antennas on the far side of the moon. So you don't get all this interference from transmitters on Earth. But it turns out that the far side of the moon is expensive for building telescopes and also the, there aren't many restaurants. <laughs> not, not yet, at least, you know, maybe in a couple of years. We, we wouldn't have any problem in building them, I mean, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, so I, now we get a little bit pessimistic with the next question, which is, uh, well, I'm modifying it a little bit to get it more interesting, actually, but, you know, never mind. Um, so it is, if no such signal is detected in the next thick decades, uh, what do you think would happen to SETI? I mean, because you said you're funded by, uh, you know, private uh, entities. So yes. do you think they will lose their, their interest? Do you think that the interest will, will always be there? What will happen? Yeah, well, that's a good question. And it's a, it's actually, I think, a very serious question. I mean, obviously, I have to buy a lot of people a cup of coffee. But in terms <laughs> of the SETI Institute uh, or SETI organizations, it might, in fact, jeopardize their funding because they, too, are hoping that by putting some money into this experiment, there will be some success. And uh, for example, there's a fellow here, not very far from where I'm speaking, uh, who's a Russian investor. And he has, he invested in Facebook and other socially valuable companies, and he's made a lot of money. So he's put, he promised $100 million to SETI. And that, that's the SETI uh, operation run out of the University of California, Berkeley, which is across the bay here. And But it's a 10-year project. So he, he figures that, you know, within 10 years, with enough money, they should be able to find something. And if they can't, the question is, well, will he continue to give money to it? And I don't know. But I'm not actually worried about that, Marco, because I think that what happens is that you get new ideas, right? Okay, that radio... The uh, experiment maybe wasn't the right way, but if you do this, maybe that is the right way. And you can say that, you know, this is an endless begging for money on the basis of new ideas. There's some truth in that, but on the other hand, um, you know, either something eventually works or you have to admit there's nobody out there. And that seems so unbelievable that I think that, you know, you will find the money if you have good ideas and good people yeah so in the end there will always be people interested in yes know, in discovering yes. all that kind of stuff yeah, yeah of course uh so if on the other hand uh there is a detection of intelligent life as salome urien asked uh asked in the in the chat 
uh, well, that would completely overturn the place human has. And regarding beliefs and religion, this would create chaos. And would this refrain you or anyone responsible for it uh, to announce the news to the general public? Yeah, no, uh, let me answer that second part first. There's no way you can stop the discovery from being known by the public. Uh, you know, there are people who believe, oh, the government would shut you guys down because it would be so dangerous for the public to know that there are aliens and they would immediately start rioting in the streets. Now, it's, it's true that Americans like to riot in the streets. You know, it's just a national pastime. But I, I can't imagine that if they, you know, looked in their looked at the news in their browser tomorrow and saw, well, scientists find a signal coming from this star system, which happens to be 2,000 light years away, that they would decide that was the time to go rioting in the streets, right? Unless it was already on their calendar. They wouldn't do it. I mean, I think that's nutty, right? So it, it won't be kept secret. But the first part of your question, which was, which was, what was the first part of your question, Margo? No, I mean, it was just, you know, the, the setting of the question, just saying that uh, discovering life uh, would uh, would create chaos in in religions yeah. and stuff. No, Do you think I, I don't that's think it's so. actually the case. No, I don't think it's the case. To begin with, one third of the American public, but also one third of the British public, and every other country in Europe, already believes that the aliens are here. Right? These UFOs, oh, those are aliens, man. Yeah, but they're they're not upset about it. Right? I mean, you don't see them, you know, deciding. All right, I'm going to, you know abandon my kids and quit my job because yeah. some UFOs are aliens. We are, we are having some noises that are there. Yes, noises. exactly. So anyhow, um, so I, I don't think that they would create any sort of uh, unrest because there's no danger. If you pick up a signal coming from who knows how many light years away and nobody knows it except you, I, I think it would have a, an effect, and usually the effect is compared to what happened when Darwin published The Origin of Species, right? When suddenly humans realized, that, well, we're actually not that special. We're descended from animals you can still find, right? These animals in Africa, wherever. So we're just another part of nature. And But people didn't quit their jobs about that. Yeah, well, but it is, it is true that there is a group of people, and well, we briefly uh, mentioned this before, but there is this group of people who are always very skeptic about, uh, you know, these scientific discoveries in general. So there might be a big reaction from that kind of group. But well, I, you know, people ask about what happens to religion. And, uh, it, but, you know, uh, Christians, Muslims, Jews have all weighed in, you know, people who, who belong to those religions and who are uh, scholars, if you will. And they say, they look at the history of things and they say, you know, would this truly upset religion? Would suddenly you stop going to church or whatever if you heard that there were aliens? And the answer is no. So probably not. But there are fundamentalists, right, in, in essentially any religion uh, who would say, well, look, the Bible doesn't say anything about aliens, right? You can read the Bible, but you won't learn much about aliens. And so consequently, they, there must not be any aliens, right? Because if it's not in the Bible, it isn't true. There are people who believe that. And they would be upset, yes. But, you know, as long as they're not your relatives, it's probably okay. I guess it is. <laughs> so um, another question uh, from Sabine Haynes. I'm really sorry about my pronunciation again. Uh, if you could get the chance to travel to space, would you go? And yes. I think, uh, before you answer, I think the second part of the question would be something like, and in case you would be able to return, because I guess the answer would vary depending on that. Yes, well, Ms. Heinz was probably hoping that I wouldn't return. I don't know. But uh, if, if I could go to space, yeah, I would do it. I mean, when I was a, a, a student, it was my hope to, you know, sometimes go into space uh, for a lot of reasons that never was going to happen. But when I was a kid, I remember I was like nine, 10 years old, I went to the planetarium in New York City and they were giving out tickets to everybody who came into the planetarium to be on the first rocket to the moon, right? 
So this was before 1969. And uh, I got one of these tickets and I was a kid and I thought, this is really a ticket to go to the moon and they're going to, you know, serve me peanuts and, uh, you know, there'll be movies on board and, you know, there'll be somebody boring sitting next to me and so forth. I mean, I just believed it until I was about, you know, 45 or something. I don't know. At some point I realized uh, it's probably just, a, you know, a publicity stunt, but I was very disappointed. I wanted to go into space, but mostly for the views, but you don't have to anymore, right? With the technology we have today, you can walk around Mars, you know, in your, in your living room, in front of your laptop. So, you know, it, you know, as, as with the restaurants in the moon, that might change in the, in the next yeah. year, maybe, well, yeah. maybe we'll be able to go to Mars for real. We'll see. Uh, then last uh, two questions. Uh, how do you fit your efforts with current research lines in astrophysics, such as Everett's many words or Max Techmark's mathematical universe? Is there any search line that is based on these cosmological models? Well, I'm not qu quite sure what the, the person has in mind here, um, but, you know, new cosmological models You know, they, they envision all sorts of things. I mean, parallel universes, multiple universes and so forth, infinite universes, semi-infinite universes, all these things. And at some level, you could say those are kind of the background to all SETI experiments. So they do have some effect, but probably not a very direct effect, not yet. It, it's like saying the kind of settings that you can create on a stage, would that affect, uh, you know, William Shakespeare? Uh, in, in writing his next play. I, mean, I, I don't think it, you know, it's there, but I don't think it's so important. All right, all right. And well, what do you think, this is the last question, about actually the, the importance that uh, the Drake equation uh, has uh, in comparison with the uh, the Fermi paradox or the rare air hypothesis, because they're, they contradict each other somehow. So what do you think that is the relevance of this and Uh, how probable do you think that ET life really is? Although I think uh, we all know the answer to that. But. Yeah, you know, you know my answer. Well, it's yeah. true. I mean, you know, sometimes people will ask me and they'll say, well, do you really think there are aliens out there? And the answer to that is, well, of course I do. Otherwise, why, why would I keep this job, right? I mean, maybe I could go into investment banking or something and make a lot of money, right? Instead, we're looking for aliens. Sounds nutty, but... Obviously, I think they're out there because they're like a trillion, that's a million, million, a million, million planets in the Milky Way. And we can see, you know, a million, million other galaxies, each with a million, million planets. So the number of planets is really big. And, and so, you know, if it, it seems uh, to violate the what's called the principle of mediocrity in science, which says that your situation is probably not all that special. It would violate that if, if we're the only only intelligent beings in the universe. So, of course, there's that. I I, I just, you know, I, I never come to the conclusion that they're not out there. Maybe I'm wrong, of course. But I, I think that the thing is that if we haven't found them, it's because we haven't found them. And it doesn't mean that they're not there. Yeah, yeah of course. I mean, they might be there. We just don't know yet we're looking for the wrong things i mean people imagine aliens to be biological for example and the majority of aliens may have gone beyond that like we're doing in this century right they may be all synthetic intelligence and in that case trying to pick them up uh, with big antennas may be the wrong approach yeah that would be the next step to uh, to computers taking our jobs <laughs> yes you guys are all the last generation to have to go to school after well, this yeah. you'll just be pets of the machines so and this is i am sorry for that because last question wasn't actually the last question this is the last question uh which i skipped uh, sorry for that uh so if one of those aliens well no actually what do you think about the claims about uh ufos and aliens uh you know coming to earth and that kind of claims uh in the and in the sense that they could be an evidence of uh, extraterrestrial, extraterrestrial intelligence. Yeah, well, they could be. I mean, if, if, if the aliens actually are here, you know, in their flying saucers, 
sort of sailing around the skies, well, that would answer the whole question of life in space, and intelligence in space. I mean, they're here, but I don't believe it. I, I get asked about this a lot, of course, by the media, because there's always some story involving UFOs. But I think that if we were being visited, that the evidence for that would be very obvious, right? There are lots of things that, you know, lots of ways we monitor the airspace of the earth. And you would just see these aliens all the time if they really were here, right? So, I mean, it, it would be like in, I don't know, 1600 going into Mexico, right? Do you think you're being visited by Spaniards? That wouldn't be very hard for them to prove. You know, just look down here, you can see they're building a cathedral over here and they're all living over there. And, you know, I'll introduce you to a couple of them. And there was no question about it, right? So it's been 60 years since the first claims that were being visited, Roswell and all that sort of thing. I think that if we were being visited, it would be very obvious. And it's definitely not obvious. Well, it is, it is obvious for one third of the uh, US population, but right. yeah, I guess it, right. it will be obvious for more people. Okay, so yep. that was actually the last question. Um, actually, I have one myself, oh. but I was right. wondering about now, if you don't mind, I mean, and yeah, this will be the very last one, I guess. So, um, yeah, I was thinking about what you said, uh, I was uh, reflecting on your brief definition of life, let's say that way. Um, so uh, one of the wo words I uh, your on purpose of what you said, it was death. So obviously, inevitably, we're programmed to die at some point. Well, are we also programmed to die as a civilization? And in that case, when that might happen, I mean, what's our possible lifespan? Because that obviously have, has lots of things to do with the Drake equation on the outcomes mm -hmm. of, of it. Yeah, so, I, I, I didn't then. answer Marco's question about the Drake equation. Uh, look, I like the Drake equation. Frank Drake came up with the Drake equation as an agenda for a meeting in 1961. That's what it was for. But, you know, it's the second most famous equation in science, according to a lot of people, with the first one being E equals MC squared, right? The most famous one. But the Drake equation is very well known too. But it's simply a way to describe the chances of a society out there broadcasting anything. So it was, you know, as I say, intended only to sort of direct discussion at a meeting. And I think that that's its principal purpose even today, because there are a lot of terms in the Drake equation that we don't know and that we cannot know without finding the aliens first, at which point, you know, once you find them, you can say, well, I don't care about the Drake equation anymore. We found ET. As, a, as, our, as, our, as our lifespan itself, I mean, usually we don't know or we won't be able to uh, make a claim on that until we find another one, which is hopefully older than us. Yeah, if you and find one, you'll probably find a lot more. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, and just in terms and in relation with this, so imagine that, I mean, I know that it's not plausible, that the most plausible option is that we actually find that there is actually life out there, but imagine that there isn't. So in that case, um, why wouldn't it be? I mean, what makes what would then make Earth so special that it, there's that it's not elsewhere in the universe? I mean, given that the universe is this way, so what would I mean in that case? What would the, the answer be? Because that would be another interesting question. Why we are to yeah, we, Joaquin? We I'm sorry. Along. Yeah, I bad connection. I am not sure I really understood your question. Can you give me the question again in one sentence? Yeah, so, I mean, even if the, if it's uh, the odds are more that there will be life elsewhere in the universe, if there is not, why would that be? If there is I mean, not. what makes Earth so special in that case? Yeah, oh, okay. Why is there life here and maybe not anywhere else? I, I think that, that that particular question will go away within 10 years because we may find that there was life on Mars. In fact, everybody talks about life on Mars, the Perseverance rover and all that stuff. And nobody really talks about, well, what if we don't find any life on Mars? What would that mean? And that would mean that maybe life isn't so easy to get started. But, and if we found that Earth was the only place with life, to begin with, that's very hard to discover, right? That means you, you, all these planets, and you got to rule them all out. And that's very difficult. There's no way we can do that. Uh, maybe in a couple of hundred years, maybe you could do some sort of experiment where you looked at a million planets like Earth 
and none of them has life, then you would say, you know, maybe life is only on this planet. But I think that very few people believe that, right? Because it just, it would again make humans very, very special. And every time we thought we were special, of course, somebody's pointed out, well, you're not that special. The earth is not the center of the solar system. And the sun is not the center of the galaxy. And this galaxy isn't the only one and so forth. There's a whole history of showing that we're ordinary, particularly my relatives. So it's uh, just a matter, I think, uh, of not being able to prove the negative, not being able to prove that we're alone. There's no way we can do that. It's not like physics. You can't falsify the experiment, but at least you can prove that we're not alone by finding something. Yeah, I mean, I get that it's just a matter of finding just one yeah. um, civilization or taking, I mean, whatever, in, 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 in whichever forms it comes, but, um, and that's it, yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's pretty much it. And Marco, before you wrap up, just to uh, remind our uh, attendees that we, I'm, I'm putting now on the chat a uh, link to a feedback form. If you can fill it in, just to check what you have enjoyed from this and what you haven't done. Pretty simple. So it just became, a, it just takes a minute. And, and yeah, Marco. Yeah, so well, thank you, Joaquin, for that. Uh, and thank you, all the lovely people that have been uh, here in this afternoon and to all the people watching this on YouTube. Uh, so before uh, we say goodbye, uh, Seth, uh, when can, where can these people, uh, uh, you know, see your content? Where can they find you? <laughs> well, unfortunately for them, I'm actually pretty easy to find. Uh, but you, obviously, you can go to places like YouTube. You just type in my name. My name is so, you know, my name is somewhat unusual. So there's only one Seth Shostak, I think, on the planet. They can find out stuff about that. But I, I would recommend that if you have any interest in these matters, just go to the SETI Institute's website, SETI.org. Simple, SETI.organization. And uh, there's a lot of stuff there. So that's it. Uh... Thank you for that. And again, thank you everyone for coming. It has been a very nice uh, afternoon, very nice interview. And thank you, Seth, for coming here. It was lovely. It's always nice to visit Manchester. <laughs> Hopefully <laughs> next time it, 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 it will be face to face. <laughs> Maybe who knows in a couple of years with another, with another committee. Come back. <laughs> OK, well, thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you all. And see you in our next event.